the devotion to the sacred head of Jesus Christ. The crowning glory of my sacred heart will be the devotion to my sacred head as the seat of divine wisdom. These were the striking words addressed to that servant of God, Teresa Helena Higginson, in 1874. Our Lord himself, she would frequently assure her spiritual director, had taught her that this sublime devotion would sum up in itself all the worship due to his sacred humanity and would be the great antidote to the pride of intellect, disbelief and conceit, which are the evils of these latter times. Our Lord deserves his sacred head to be worshipped as the seat of divine wisdom, said Teresa. Teresa Higginson was born here in Hollywell on the 27th of May 1844. Her father Robert was a Catholic educated at Stonyhurst and her mother Mary a convert to the Catholic faith before her marriage to Robert. She encountered fierce opposition from her family who hated the Catholic Church. Teresa's mother became a devout Catholic but did not enjoy good health and concerned over her pregnancy with Teresa, travelled to Holywell on pilgrimage from Gainsborough where they were living to pray at the shrine of St Winifred and to bathe in the waters with the intention of a safe birth. Her prayers were answered and Teresa was born and then baptised here in the parish church of Holywell on the 22nd of June 1844, before her mother returned to the family home in Gainsborough. Teresa was one of five sisters and three brothers and enjoyed a happy Catholic childhood in Gainsborough. Both of her parents loved God and imparted this love to their children. It was very much a sheltered life, with a number of priests among their friends, including, as a guest, Father Dominic Barbary, the famous Passionist who often carried little Teresa in his arms. He was also responsible for bringing into the church blessed John Henry Newman. Teresa's first big sacrifice, and there were many, came when it was decided that she and her two sisters, Louisa and Mary Ann, were to be educated at the Sisters of Mercy Convent School in Nottingham, when Teresa was only ten years of age. They arrived on a Friday in Lent, when Teresa practised for the first time the devotions of the cross, and spent the next eleven years in study. Teresa longed to follow her suffering Lord and there was much anxiety as to her vocation in life. Previously in 1864, after completing her studies, she went to consult the Passionist Father Ignatius Spencer here at Sutton Monastery in St Helens, Lancashire. He exclaimed, Thank God you have come to me and encouraged her to continue her teaching and told her that she did not have a vocation to be a nun though later on he told her that she would live in a convent for a while. He assured her that God had special designs on her and to be very open to her spiritual director. Teresa's doubts were over and Almighty God was calling her to teach little children how to love him. At the age of 21 she completed her studies to become a teacher and Teresa returned here to St Helens to the family home in 1865. One day her father returned home in a state of great anxiety and told his wife Mary, I am ruined, I have ruined you all. A forwarding agent, her father had been dealing in the cotton industry which went disastrously wrong owing to the American Civil War. Teresa had a great dread of riches and had prayed that her family become poor. Her prayer was answered and she felt quite guilty when her father was made bankrupt and had to move to Liverpool where the family suffered many hardships that year. In 1871 there was a terrible smallpox and cholera epidemic which broke out in Liverpool and the nearby towns. Bootle in the north of Liverpool was badly affected in one parish alone, St Anthony's on Scotland Road, Liverpool, 15,000 people had died. 
schools had to be closed for the want of teachers. One parish priest, Father Edward Powell, at St Alexander's in Bootle, a zealous holy priest, had the intentions of the children at heart, as they were running wild in the streets due to the shortage of teachers. He had heard of Miss Teresa Higginson, who, it was said, had a wonderful influence on the children. Without hesitation and without regard for her own safety, Teresa accepted the offer to teach the children at St Alexander's School, many of whom had been orphaned. The only building left standing here is the presbytery, now in commercial use, which was next to the church. Father Powell gratefully accepted, and the two souls were now destined to play a great part in each other's lives. Teresa was a great success with the children in Bootle, and even the grown-ups eagerly attended her catechism classes on Sundays. Teresa decided to pray an extra 15 mysteries of the rosary each day for 15 days, with the intention of bringing back some of the many lapsed in the parish. She asked, which is the worst street in the parish, and was told it was Morden Street, which she visited after which 27 people decided to go to confession and through Teresa joined the Holy Family Confraternity. In 1873, Teresa was sent to another large school here in St Mary's Wigan for three years. To all appearances, she seemed to be an ordinary teacher, but inwardly these were important years for her spiritual advancement. It was Teresa's constant aim to avoid notice and she tried to disguise from others the many spiritual favours which Almighty God was pouring into her soul. Teresa had no regard for money or for clothes. What she wore were the cast-offs of her sisters. She was always good-humoured, never looked cross, and her pupils loved her. She seemed to live as it were in the presence of God. A new teacher was appointed to St Mary's School in Wigan at the end of 1873, Miss Susan Ryland. Teresa soon recognised in her the friend Father Spencer had promised our Lord would send in her time of need. Hard worked and poorly paid was the loss of a Catholic teacher in those days. Susan was with her until July of 1875. Teresa never spoke of her inner life, but Miss Ryland wrote on the visitations of Our Lord and Our Lady and St. Joseph and the Saints, and from the Evil One. In Lent of 1874, Teresa followed Our Lord in his sacred passion. On the 22nd of March 1874, Passion Sunday, whilst at Wigan, Teresa tells Miss Ryland about receiving the crown of thorns on her head. Five days later, on the Friday morning of Passion Week, on the 27th of March, Teresa receives the stigmata and pleads with our Lord to take it away. It was witnessed by several of her friends. When Teresa was coming out of St Mary's Church, she met Margaret Woodward, a teacher, and mentioned for the first time, our Lord wants a devotion to his sacred head. It was also here in Wigan, on the 12th of June 1874, on the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, Teresa attained that degree of union with our Blessed Lord, known as the Spiritual Espousal, when he placed a small ring like a crown of thorns and cross on her finger. This was an indication of the thorns and crosses and dryness in her life. Canon Snow, another later director, relates that Teresa was being led along the path of mystical union with her Lord. He remarked, When a soul is drawn closer to God, so much more intense is the purification. Teresa would place herself in the first pew on the right of the church. Teresa was prepared by our Lord for this great event over a number of years for the ceremony of the mystical espousal. This is what St. Teresa the Great called the spiritual betrothal. 
the promise of what is to come, for it leads to the mystical marriage. Teresa never spoke of this at the time, and it was only later, under obedience to her spiritual director, when she was asked to keep a diary, that she described the events to Father Powell at Bootle in Liverpool. In 1877, the Jesuit fathers opened a new mission here at Sabden, a small village near Clitheroe in North Lancashire. Primitive conditions made it difficult to staff the school. It had a reputation of being a rough area. Though in frail health and against her parents' advice, Teresa took up the teaching post at Sabden. She said goodbye to her father, and that was the last time she would see him, for on the 13th of October 1877, he took a seizure in the street in St Helens and almost immediately died, having just received the last sacraments of the church. Teresa wrote later that she had had a vision of her father lying in the street dying. On receiving a telegram brought in by a priest, she told him, before opening it, I knew Papa had died. Often, there was no mass at Sabden during the week, and trees would have to walk five miles over the rough hill country to Clitheroe for her mass and five miles back to school. She pleaded with our Lord to help her, and her beloved spouse would come to give her communion three or four times a day. These miraculous communions took place frequently and over a number of years and were attested by many witnesses. Father Lee, the parish priest, was very distressed when Teresa, through ill health, had to leave Sabden in 1879. In the autumn of 1879, Father Powell offered Teresa a second term in his school at St Alexander's in Bootle. She joyfully accepted. Father Powell and then later Canon Snow would be her spiritual advisers, two very devout priests. She went to lodge with Mrs Nicholson and her daughter, a convert to the faith who kept a little shop adjoining St Alexander's church and had a tiny back room looking on to the wall of the church and with a table by the window. It was here Teresa wrote under obedience her diary letters on the sacred head devotion. She wrote most of her many letters on the sacred head to Father Powell, here in Bootle, and she foresaw that it would be become a great place of pilgrimage. These are the volumes of Teresa's letters, a set of which is in the British Museum in London. The centrepiece of Teresa's letters were our Lord's requests, as she states, He gave me to understand, and a special devotion and veneration should be paid to the sacred head of our Lord, as the seat of divine wisdom, and guiding power of the sacred heart, and so complete the heavenly devotion. To Father Powell, Our Lord had shown me that your requests will be granted, and that there will be great wonders, he will bring to pass in our very midst that the eyes of all nations will be turned towards us and pilgrims will come from afar off. Teresa says that our Lord had suddenly represented to her the divinity as a very large bright crystal stone in which all things are reflected or are past, present and to come in such a manner that all things are present in him. This immense precious stone sent forth streams of richly coloured light, greater than ten thousand suns, which I understood represented the infinite attributes of God. This great jewel also seemed to be covered with innumerable eyes, which I understood to represent the wisdom and knowledge of God. Teresa had mentioned that St John speaks of this devotion to the Sacred Head as the seat of divine wisdom, and Father Powell asked her for the reference. She replied, Our Lord did not answer specifically at that time, 
But after Holy Communion, on the morning of the 23rd of May, 1880, Teresa states, regarding the reference to St. John, He gave me to understand that it was spoken of in the last two chapters of the Book of Revelations, and with this mark were sealed the number of the elect. Later, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads, and is not the seat of divine wisdom a new heaven and a new earth? The soul and the intellectual faculties and the dwelling place of the Most High. When these apparitions occurred, Teresa would lose all of her bodily strength on seeing our Lord in his glorified humanity and great majesty. Teresa would place herself in the front bench of St. Alexander's Church she had many of her visions here. In Easter week of 1880, she wrote, I went into the church at 5 a.m. Our Lord represented himself as we see him in pictures of the sacred heart and sacred head, radiant as a sea of light and glorious sun shining to its very depths and acting on the affections and motives and entire workings of the sacred heart and raising them even as the sun draws up the vapours from the ocean. In this light I saw distinctly formed the figure of a silvery dove, which I understood was the Holy Spirit, and rows of glory or pillars as a rainbow appeared, above which I felt represented the Eternal Father. The whole formed an eye which I knew was the eye of God, in unity, and from it I understood that our blessed Lord wished his sacred head to be especially worshipped as the seat of divine wisdom and the powers of his human soul adored therein, as it is the seat of the intellectual powers of man. On the 27th of April, Teresa wrote, Our divine Lord says, The time is at hand when the wisdom of the Father should be adored and the love of God for man shall be revealed in the light which shines in the darkness and enlightens every man that comes into the world. It is the will of our Lord that his sacred head be adored as the seat of divine wisdom. Not the sacred head alone, no, but the head as the shrine of the powers of the soul and the faculties of the mind. And in these, the wisdom which guides every affection of the sacred heart and motions of the whole being of Jesus, our Lord and our God. On the 9th of November, 1882, Father Wilberforce, an eminent theologian of the day, defended the devotion to the sacred head as being theologically sound. He stated that it bears a striking analogy to the devotion in honour of the sacred heart, which beats in the breast of our incarnate God. Yet not simply as a material object of worship, but as the shrine and symbol of the love of Jesus Christ. He states, There would appear to be no objection to a devotion in honour of the sacred head as the shrine of the intellectual faculties and powers of the soul of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father Wilberforce said that he also practised the devotion to the sacred head. Teresa wrote, On Sunday our Lord seemed to bathe me in his most precious blood, and showed me how the devotion to his holy soul, sorrowful unto death, and the seat of divine wisdom, was only another means which his love urged to draw us more closely to his most sacred heart, and is not intended in any way to take the place of the devotion to his sacred heart, but only to complete and further it. Our Lord impressed upon me the infinite love of his sacred heart for us, and how he suffers from the neglects of his children. There is no pang like this loving in vain, which Jesus suffers so intensely. In 1883, Bishop O'Reilly of Liverpool instructed Father Powell to cease in his direction of Teresa. She was further instructed not to write any more on the Sacred Head devotion. Father Powell would later be transferred to another parish here at Our Lady's Lydiot, and Teresa would visit him there. He would stay there for the next 40 years 
until his death. In June 1883, our Lord showed me how man outrages the divine wisdom by the abuse of the three powers of his immortal soul, which are the intellect, the will and the heart, and by his sins stamps out as far as he can the image of God in himself, and by mad folly tries to rob nature of its God, tries to prove that matter is eternal and creative in itself, and that there is no God or need for God, and that man is darkened by his infidelity. And this takes away faith, which is the light of the soul. If we have no faith, we cannot love or serve God. And so God provides an antidote for these offences. God provides a victim, the Christ, a peace offering, a sacrifice of propitiation, the seat of created and uncreated wisdom, our Lord crowned with thorns, and our Lord complained lovingly, but my soul is not loved, and so he wishes his soul to be comforted. Canon Snow had previously been transferred to a new mission here in St Mary's Orton, near Ormskirk in 1879, and after much prayer took over the direction of Teresa, where she would visit him regularly here, travelling from Bootle. At Bootle, our Lord told Teresa he wishes for a feast to be celebrated in honour of the seat of divine wisdom, and said that the Friday, eight days after the Feast of the Sacred Heart, should be dedicated as a feast day in its honour, and special reparation and atonement to be offered to him. On the 6th of June 1884, on Whit Sunday, our Lord made known to Teresa that it would not be by wonders and miracles that he would make known the devotion to the Sacred Head. As Father Powell realised, Teresa was progressing to the highest degree of union with our Lord, it seems, the mystical marriage. What is associated with this union are a great increase in trials and crosses to bear, and the mortification of the senses. The searching fires of opposition and persecution, not only from the world and the devil, but especially from good and well-meaning friends, was a regular occurrence. Teresa wanted to remain hidden, but as rumours of her extraordinary life spread abroad, friends and foes arose, and sides were taken, for and against her. The clamour of which Canon Snow speaks of reached such a pitch that the Bishop of Liverpool, Dr O'Reilly, requested a judgment on this matter. Father Powell wrote, showing an unshakable belief in Teresa, before at Sabden, there was an accusation that she had stolen a hundred pounds and the police were called. Later it was discovered that the accusation was unfounded and that the money had been mislaid. Teresa's main concern at this time was that all these occurrences would hamper the spread of devotion to the sacred head. Her teaching post was taken from her at Bootle and her landlady also told her I can't take these goings on any more, and wrote to Teresa to say that she would have to vacate her lodgings here at Ariel Street, where Teresa had moved after the death of Mrs Nicholson. It was April 1886. After talking to Father Powell, Teresa left Liverpool, after realising she would not get another teaching post there, and eventually got another position at New Church, where her friends Miss Cattrall and Miss Nicholson, who were teachers at that school, and Teresa stayed about four months. On May the 18th, 1887, Miss Cattrall wrote to Canon Snow that Teresa seemed virtually to be in a constant state of ecstasy and expressing her wish to receive Holy Communion. Ten minutes later, Miss Cattrall witnessed the sacred host, the Eucharist, a light on Teresa's tongue these occurrences were reported on many occasions. The wonderful ceremony of her mystical marriage took place on the 23rd of October 1887 here at Clitheroe, North Lancashire, where she had gone to stay once again 
with her friend Miss Dawson, who had this small terraced house. It is believed that this ceremony took place in this back bedroom during the night and overlooking the church where Teresa had worshipped on many occasions. She wrote at once to Canon Snow and then more fully to Father Powell on Sunday the 23rd of October. Teresa stated, I tried to make the same act of oblation to Jesus my God as he made to his Heavenly Father during his most bitter passion. Then in the evening I begged of the angel Raphael to guide me to my divine spouse as he did with young Tobias and the angel of the Incarnation to present my soul and body for ever. Teresa begged the angel to present her through the hands of Mary, his queen and my mother, as a clean oblation. This I repeated several times, O wisdom of the sacred head, guide me in all my ways. O love of the sacred heart, consume me with thy fire. Later our Lord spoke these words, I espouse thee in the name and in the presence of the uncreated Trinity and in the presence of my Immaculate Mother, and I give you to her as a daughter and my spouse for ever. St. Teresa of Avila says, More cannot be said than that the soul becomes one with God. On the 28th of October 1887, Canon Snow wrote to congratulate her. Teresa was aged 43 at this time. It seemed that our Lord was withdrawing her from public gaze and she became stronger and felt our Lord was calling her to Scotland. Canon Snow advised that she stay at the Divine Mercy Convent in Edinburgh where his sister was the Mother Superior. Teresa had several short-term teaching posts over a period near here. In Edinburgh at St Catherine's Convent, despite her sufferings, she was always cheerful and happy. One of the sisters described her as the merriest soul. Teresa would tell them stories in the refectory and never tired of doing little acts of kindness. It was here that she would foretell details of World War I and look with pity on various boys in the school, many of whom were to die in battle, she said. She would regularly attend the Jesuit church near the convent and also St Mary's Cathedral in Edinburgh for Mass. The chief devotion that Teresa tried to instill into the children was to the wisdom of our Lord's sacred head, combined with the love of the sacred heart. Mrs McKeown was taught by Teresa and relates this story from when she was ten years of age. I distinctly remember an instruction Teresa gave us in 1889. The lesson was on the Incarnation. At the end she asked us all to kneel and honour our Lord's Sacred Heart beating beneath the heart of Our Lady before he was born into the world. There were several cases of bilocation on Teresa's part and these were attested by the religious sisters. The devil still came to torment her but he seems to have had little power over her, except to spit at her, she said. She would busy herself in this kitchen. In October 1891 and 1892, Teresa spent some weeks at her sister's house at Neston in Cheshire, seeing Canon Snow and many of her friends. It was here at Neston that Teresa described the mystical mass that our Lord celebrated for her in her room. This, it was believed, to have occurred on a number of occasions through her life. Teresa's love of the Mass and the sacrament of the Eucharist is so obvious. It's so evident from the time wherever she moved, every house she moved to was so near the church. Now that had to be part of her planning, her devotion to the Mass, her devotion to the Eucharist, was wonderful and it was the centre point of her life. It wasn't that she was being distracted by any other devotion. The centre point of her life, her devotion to Christ, was the Mass 
and the Eucharist. Canon Snow told the sisters of the convent that one day when passing her room, he saw her raised in ecstasy and she received the sacred host. Teresa would have been familiar with these scenes of Liverpool. When Dr O'Reilly, the Bishop of Liverpool, who had dealt so severely with her, fell ill, she prayed fervently for him, and on hearing of his death, she described him as our dear good bishop. Father Powell wrote, Teresa had been able to arise above all difficulties. She had worked previously with a teacher called Maggie Garnett, who had died in 1903. The same year, Maggie's brother, who had an infirmity of the leg, and his sister were in need of an income. Teresa set about to find a shop for them to rent as a general store. The shop was located at 134 Mount Pleasant, opposite the Poor Law Institute, also known as the Workhouse. Teresa and poverty and humility, they went together. Teresa, in her teaching career, you would always find Teresa with the poorest of the poor, always giving of herself totally. Here in Neston, helping her sister out, the poor children that would be in that school, they were hungry children, children of Irish miners, children who needed kindness and love, which they most certainly received from Teresa. And then the plague in Liverpool, which killed so many thousands of people, over to Bootle she goes, to teach the orphans, to be there with those people who needed support, needed help, who needed kindness and love more than anything else. And Teresa radiated that, that kindness and, and that sense of hope for something better. And her devotion to children, and her love of children, that comes across time and time again in, in the story of her life and her total dedication to poverty and to humility. Teresa went to stay with the Garnets to look after them. Alf, who couldn't walk very far, was told by Teresa in 1903 that the site would become a Roman Catholic cathedral. When Alf questioned Teresa, do you mean an Anglican cathedral? Teresa replied, no, it will be a Roman Catholic cathedral. The Roman Catholic Church did not purchase the land until 1930. Mr Garnet would remind people in 1930 of what Teresa had stated 27 years earlier. This is the Metropolitan Cathedral of Christ the King today. Our Lord lovingly complained to Teresa, My soul is not known, my soul is not loved. Night and day I see living lamps burning before my altar. My sacrament of love finds worshippers and victims, but my soul does not meet with sympathizing souls. Every day I give myself to my creatures, and swallowed up in this union, they praise everything in me but my soul and my sacred head crowned with thorns, the seat of divine wisdom. Remember, O most holy soul of my Jesus, all thou hast done and suffered for my soul, and let it not perish. After the death of Miss Garnet, Teresa felt it necessary to take up teaching again in 1903. She had had no full-time job for the last 16 years except for several short-term teaching posts and instructing anyone who would listen on the Sacred Head devotion, although there were many acts of charity. Teresa found a teaching position in a little village here at Chudley in Devon in 1904 at Lord Clifford's estate, where she would teach once again little children how to love God. Teresa would worship in this church, about a mile from her cottage, for about a year until her death. The school had broken up for Christmas, and Teresa was about to travel home to Neston. On the morning of the 14th of December 1904, she was waiting for a cab when she had a sudden severe stroke and was found lying on the floor of her cottage, helpless but conscious. Neighbours carried her up to bed. She seemed to have joined our Lord again in his sufferings for the last eight weeks. 
Her sister Louise had arrived in Chudley, and both she and the nursing sister prayed the rosary and litanies, together with other prayers, and on the 15th of February 1905, Teresa died. Regarding Teresa and her cause, and her devotion to the Sacred Head, it really is a parallel with the Gospel story of the Apostle has been ordered not to preach Christ's message. And Nicodemus getting up in the Sanhedrin and saying, look at, why are you so worried? If this is man and only man's message, it will die. But if it is God, you're actually opposing God. Now Teresa's message is the same, that if it is just purely man and has no God influence, then it would have died ages ago. But the very fact that it's gaining momentum, I'm getting letters from all over the world, the, the Eastern Europe, South America, North America, asking for more details, that the fact that it's gaining momentum shows God's influence and shows the fact that it is something good and something positive. Her body was returned by train here to Neston Station. There was a priest from the Leeds Diocese who drove over from Leeds on a Sunday evening, once he'd finished his Masses on that Sunday, to say a prayer of thanksgiving, because Teresa he attributed to be the intercessor in getting the bishop to do something that he'd been trying to get the bishop to do for over 10 years, and the bishop had been refusing. Now he read Teresa's abridged version of her life into the early hours the previous night, and became so enthralled, he says, Well, right, Teresa, if you're half as good as this book says you are, there's something I want you to do for me. And would you believe, half past eight on that Sunday morning, the phone rang, and it was the bishop, saying, Look, I've been thinking over what you've been asking about all these years, and I think we'll go ahead and do it. And he was just overwhelmed. So much so he made the promise there, and then he'd come across personally, stand by a grave, and say thank you in, in prayer. Just one of the many, many stories that have been related to me over the years of miracles, it must be miracles of intercession by, by Teresa. And then Teresa's cortege wound its way through the streets of Little Neston to the church of St Winifred's for her funeral mass and to be placed in her mother's grave next to the little schoolhouse where she had often stayed. St Winifred's Roman Catholic Church in Neston has become a place of pilgrimage for people from far and wide. Sacred head of Jesus, who deigned to tell Simon that he did not anoint thy head when thou entered his house, guide, guide me in all my ways. Sacred head of Jesus, bathed in sweat of blood in Gethsemane, guide me in all my ways. Sacred head of Jesus, who directs the movements of the divine heart, who governs the world, guide me in all my ways. Sacred head of Jesus, who will judge all our actions, guide, guide me in all my ways. Sacred Head of Jesus, who knows the secrets of our hearts, guide, guide me in all my ways. Sacred Head of Jesus, that we want to make known and adored by the whole world, guide me in all my ways. We adore thy Sacred Head, O Jesus, and we submit ourselves to all the decrees of thine infinite wisdom. Teresa's main concern in life was the promotion of the devotion 
to the sacred head of Christ, seat of divine wisdom, and she continued to spread this devotion until the end of her life on earth, stating that it was the antidote and remedy for man's intellectual pride in our own time.